reading from 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13, to the end of the chapter. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it's written, Be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a Father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have a sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Well, the passage this morning begins with, therefore. Therefore. And anytime you find a therefore in Scripture, you want to ask yourself, what's that therefore? Well, it's kind of like this. Because the Father has chosen you, because the Spirit is sanctifying you, because you are obedient to Jesus, therefore you're going to live like this, right? Uh, Because um, of all the things that God has done for you, because of the resurrection, because of the inheritance that waits for you, because we face suffering now and do so with joy, because we love Jesus even though we haven't seen him yet with our eyes, because of all these things, therefore, therefore, live this way. Therefore, the passage says, use your minds. Therefore, with hope, with minds fully alert and sober. So before we get into the details of that, I just want to say this piece here, that you need your brain for this journey. Sometimes people think that Christians are like, yeah, they're kind of like dopey. They're shallow end of the pool thinkers. Uh, you got to check your brain at the door if you're going to be a Christian. When you go to church, don't scratch too much. Don't look for too many, too many questions. Like, no, that's not it at all. You got to go deeper. You got to think better. You need to, you need to uh, read better books. Nothing could be further from the truth that faith is somehow cut off from, from reason. So love the Lord your God with all of your, with all of your mind. Now, I just want to say this, that if Christianity wasn't true, if I knew deep down in my heart this stuff actually isn't true, I wouldn't want you to believe it. I wouldn't believe it myself. We're not propping this thing up on fumes and, uh, you know, uh, duct tape and binder twine. Not at all. This is rock solid, sure, and good. So alert and sober. For sure, Peter's referring, because the word's so connected with it, but, but to an overuse of alcohol. So Christians aren't against alcohol, but the overuse of alcohol, right? That's, that's a problem. In fact, anything that would make you stupid, anything that just kind of puts you into, a, into some kind of mental drunkenness or, or into a fog, you know, um, something like gaming too much, uh, video gaming too much, or gambling, or, or porn, certainly, right? Anything that puts you in it, I, I'm, I'm embarrassed to ever talk about a struggle of my life back in a season where I was looking at porn, but, but I look back now and I say, what a fog I was in. I was just like partially present. Now, thank you, Jesus, for walking me out of that, right? That's what he's talking about, alert and fully sober. I have a friend of mine who gave up drinking a couple years ago, and he said, when I was drinking, I was a genius, you know? It's kind of like that, lo- that line from one of my favorite movies, The Princess Bride, you know? Have you ever heard of Plato? Aristotle? Socrates? Morons, right? So when he was in these conversations, when he was drinking, he was like, man, I am so friggin' smart, and all my friends are all smart. He said, when I cleaned up, and I went back to the same parties, and I got into conversations with the same guys. They were shooting their mouths off, and they couldn't have sounded dumber. So I can't believe how fogged I was because of the alcohol. Anyway, 
This is the deal. If there's anything that makes you stupid, God says to you, in the name of Jesus, get rid of it. And if you're wondering, I don't think I have anything that makes me stupid in my life, ask your roommate. I found my wife to be fairly insightful. Anybody else's wife? voice always sound like the Holy Spirit? Like, is that, is that a thing for me? Anyway, I'm just saying to you, if there's something in your life, Peter's saying, get rid of it. It's actually a, a word for athletes. Um, you know, if you're an athlete, you got to give up some, some bad stuff. You got to give up the Kentucky Fried Chicken and you got to give up the Doritos for breakfast and all that kind of stuff. But you also have to give up some good stuff to be a good athlete. And so he's talking about that. It's sort of like trim things away so you can run this in fact, the, the real word here um, is gird up your loins. Gird up your loins mentally. That's an ancient Middle East picture of what would happen when a man needed to do some serious work. So in the Middle East, it's all about being stately. And so men, women, they would have sort of these longish garments and they would move, you know, n- not in a rush, like at a, at a, at a leisurely pace. But if for some reason you had to run or walk fast or get involved in strenuous activity, you would gird up your loins, you'd pull your garments between your legs and fasten them off and then you would book it. And that's what Peter's saying here. Gird up your loins mentally so that you can, and he says, so that you can consider the hope that you've got in the grace that's coming to you in the Lord Jesus. So the passage goes on to say, don't conform to the evil desires that you you used to have, right? Wrap your thoughts around hope. Don't be conformed to the evil desires that you used to be, used to have. So the kind of stuff that even happens in our culture, like the TGIF, you know, thank God it's Friday, I'm gonna get hammered, right? I'm just gonna escape this world for a while. That's not it for us. Don't conform to those old desires that, that used to, you know, call your name in the middle of the night. Maybe they still call your name in the middle of the night. You know, name that thing and let a friend know that that's a struggle and then don't let garbage shape you. But the passage goes on to say, just as he who called you is holy, so you be holy in all you do. Don't be shaped by garbage. Do be shaped by who God is. Learn to be like the one who loves you, who, who is holy. For it is written, be holy just as I am holy. Where does that come from? It comes from Leviticus. And there's three different places in Leviticus. Leviticus is a bit of a heavy slog. Those of you who are reading your Bible through, you're like, when people say, yeah, I tried, but I quit. I go, where did you quit? You know, and they usually go, yeah, it's Leviticus. It's just a heavy lift. So if you got to skim Leviticus, skim it. But don't miss, don't miss, there's good parts in there. And three times God says to the people of Israel, because he's trying to get them to be different than every other nation on the planet, be holy because I am holy. And the first time he says it's around eating food that wasn't designed to be eaten. And the second time he says it is around having sex with people that sex wasn't designed for. That's not it. And then the third one is around consulting mediums, uh, like, um, you know, channelers or whatever, spiritualists, whatever, and, and, and bowing down to idols. And three times God says, be holy because I'm holy and don't do those things. And largely the, largely the rules around be holy um, were about not doing certain things. Don't do this. And the, the fear was always, well, if you do that, you get contaminated, which is, which, is a, which is a concern with humans. Get contaminated. There's another half side, at least, to holiness, though. And it comes out super clear in Jesus. And, and it's not just not doing the dumb stuff, but it's actually about having this powerful, purifying presence. So there are stories that really highlight God's holiness. And the ones that would, would, would highlight would be like, like God meeting Moses at the burning bush. Or like God coming into the temple when Solomon was dedicating it. Or, or years later when Isaiah was there by himself and God met him there. So these instances of holiness. And in, in none of those situations was God concerned he was going to get contaminated. In fact, it was the other way around, right? That he actually was going to purify what was around him. Jesus made this super clear, right? He's out there touching lepers and a a bleeding woman touches him and and people who are sick and the dead people. These were all like contraband, contaminants. But Jesus wasn't concerned about getting contaminated. In fact, what he was doing was he wasn't concerned about getting contaminated by the broken. He was actually healing the broken, making it right. So I'm going to say this. There's dumb stuff that you're going to have to walk away because you want to be holy like the one who calls you is holy. 
But there's also moments and situations where you have to go into kind of like dirty stories, difficult situations, troubled lives. And you don't go, whoa, I'm a Christian. I can't go near there. You're like, hey, Jesus, alive in me, would you be a powerful presence for good and for healing and for hope here? And that would be part of what God's saying here, be holy because I'm holy. Since you have a father who judges, that's, uh, this is verse 7, 17. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. Reverent fear. What's up with that? We're supposed to be scared of God? We're supposed to be like trembling over in the corner of the sanctuary? Well, well, maybe, actually, but let me just be super clear about this. When you give your life to Jesus Christ, you are done with any fear that at the end of time, you will come under condemnation or punishment. Jesus took all your punishment, all your condemnation on himself. So there is no fear at the end of time when there will be a judgment day, and there will be for a believer. For those who choose not to believe, the Bible is super clear. I'm not making this up. I'm not trying to be mean. The Bible is super clear that that will be an awful day for those who choose not to believe. But for those who have believed, you're off free. However, however, right now we have a Father who loves us and who will discipline us. Yes, right now this will happen right? And there's a chastening. There's a pruning. And so what, this, what Peter's saying is don't play fast and loose with God, like somehow because you know at the end of time there's no judgment, that somehow right now there's no judgment. I can get away with doing whatever I want to. That's not a thing. And so Peter's saying, hey, heads up, stay alert, reverent fear, stay focused. You know, sadly, we've got a number of stories, and another one came out not so long ago of these great we're great Christian leaders, really great articulators of the gospel and the hope and all that kind of stuff. And they, they're getting busted. They must have come to a point in their lives where they thought, I'm not going to get caught. And God's like, guess what? You're judged impartially. No one gets away. No one's got to get out of jail card free deal. So no favorites. That's what he's saying. No one, no one gets off. For verse 18, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors. Right? It's not that. So, so what's going on here? Well, let's, let's just back up for a second. There's kind of like two angles on this passage. Kind of like, don't do this and do that. And so, just so we're on the same page here, this is now about the third time that Peter said something like, you used to live in ignorance. Or there used to be an empty way of life that you pursued. Or there are perishable things that you pursued that are no longer worth pursuing. Chase the imperishable. Chase that which will will last. And so Peter is clearly saying to his believing friends, listen, people get this wrong. The world often gets this wrong. Don't you get it wrong. Even though you believe in Jesus, you can still slip back into old patterns. Don't you get it wrong, right? And they must have been. They must have been going back to old patterns of getting drunk. They must have gone back to old patterns of piling up gold. You know, that's what we got handed down to us by our ancestors. It's always been this way. These are the things that we chase, right? And Peter's saying, no, no, no. Remember what these things are. Money is just a tool. It's a tool to invest in what God is doing. And it is only on loan to you for a short time. When you, hey, you die penniless or you die with a billion dollars at the end of your life. Give it all back to God. It all goes back to the one who loaned it to you, right? It's, it's a tool. Don't ever forget that and start piling up money again for yourself. What you want is something precious and valuable. That's a good desire. But if you want what's precious and valuable, well then look at here, verse 19. The precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before creation of the world and he was revealed in these last times for your sake. Just got to say it this way. All the gold in the world, all the money you could ever pile up for yourself, none of it, none of it will ever get close to having the same value of the blood of Jesus. Why is that? Well, that's because all of the money that Jeffrey Bezos has, he's the Amazon guy, right? He's worth, oh, he's going to be the first trillionaire or something. All of that money won't buy him what only Jesus can give you, right? You think about eternal life, you know, forgiveness from sins. Think about hope. Think about knowing that you have this one who has an unshakable love for you. Think about changing the world for forever, for good. Just don't fall back into the lie that more money 
is going to make you happier. It won't. It, it doesn't. It never has. Okay, verse, verse 22. Now that you've been purified yourselves, now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. That's a, that's a neat picture, right? Love one another. I mean, you can't get tired of this. And we want to be super clear when we're Christians that love isn't like, I just feel warm and fuzzy about you. That's not it, right? It's not a, a glandular thing, an emotional thing. Love has always been for Christians an action. It's a, it's a go word. It's a, it's a do word. It's, it moves, right? It's not passive. It's not cheap. And we know this because of Jesus. Jesus who loved us and laid his life down for us. For God so loved the world that he, he felt warm and fuzzy about all of us. No, no. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Real love is never passive. Real love uh, is never cheap. It's always expensive. So, you have sincere love for each other. Love one another deeply from the heart. I feel like the passage is saying, you're working at this and like redouble your efforts and like take it to another level. I don't know if you've seen this before or heard, uh, you probably have, but I, I saw we'll read it. This, uh, this is actually a copy of the, the note that President Bush left for the incoming President Clinton. This is back in the early 90s. So one president handing off to another president. They'd had, you know, they'd, they'd campaigned against each other. They'd, they'd poked each other's policies and platforms and, and done all that kind of stuff. But here's, uh, Bush lost the election. Clinton won it. And then, and then uh, Bush left Clinton a note on the, uh, what is that, the Resolute Desk in the Oval Office? Dear Bill, when I just walked into this office now, I felt the same sense of wonder and respect that I felt four years ago. I know that you will feel that too. I wish you great happiness here. I never felt the loneliness that some presidents have described. There will be very tough times made even more difficult by criticism that you may not think is fair. I'm not a very good one to give advice. Just don't let the critics discourage you or push you off course. You will be our president when you read this note and I wish you well. I wish your family well. Your success now is our country's success. I'm rooting hard for you. Good luck, George. Now, I know, I know what you're thinking. Good luck with that happening. But I, it's easier and fun, right, to point out where other people aren't maybe loving like they could or should. I just want you to hear it again. Love each other deeply. You know, sometimes Christians get heated and against each other. And we get different opinions and... and uh, Today maybe is the day to offer to repair that. Today is the day to pray. God, my heart's not quite right in this, and I need like heart surgery. I can go towards bitterness, and I can go towards resentment, and I can go towards unforgiveness, and, and I want condescending attitude. I want a heart surgery, so that I, don't, I don't do that stuff anymore. I want to love people better. Verse 23, because you've been born again. Right, Not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring Word of God. Uh, finish this off. For all people are like grass. All their glory is like the flowers of the field. Grass withers, flowers fall, but the Word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the Word that was preached to you. Hey, you and me, we're like the winter snow. I mean, right now, it feels like it's going to be here forever, but we know Three months, maybe just two months, the winter snow will be gone. Well, you and me, we're like, we're like grass in the summer sun. You know, it's not too long before that stuff all dies off and goes white. Like, we get 70 years, we get 80 years, poof, it's gone. And Peter's reminding us, hey, lash yourself, latch on to that which is for eternity. Attach your life to that which will last, the Word of God the hope that God has spoken to Jesus, who is the Word of God, to reading the Bible, which is the Word of God, but to the Word of hope that will hold you in this life and through the next. Hey friends, go. Go in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Go in the love of God the Father. Go in the friendship of the Spirit today and tomorrow and forever. Amen. Amen.